It's the Bush League Mud Show. It's the Bush League Mud Show. Let's go. Are you ready? Make some noise! All right, yo, yo, yo. What is going on is another edition is the Bush League Mud Show. Slade. PJ. Giving you the AEW review for February 9th of 2000. And 22, this show was done in Atlantic City. This one was all about going to the show. It was all about Tony Khan's surprise. Real quick, uh, before we run down the AEW Dynamite review, we'll also throw it out there that you can like and subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, especially YouTube where we upload these. Social media, follow us. Promise we'll follow back at Bush League MS Pod. On social media. All right, so yeah, man, this was all about who Tony Khan was going to bring out as a surprise. We ended up getting well, a no, couple of surprises I'm, throughout this show, but I'm still the waiting. That- he he said it was going to be a huge announcement. I'm still waiting for the fucking announcement. When he does shit like this and says he's going to have a huge announcement, and then he just throws the shit on his show, then that's where I get a little fraternal. I I just get a little pissed at that. I I don't know, but it's just like. Dude, what are you doing? Make the goddamn announcement yourself. Well, the announcer, this is all about a huge debut that Tony Khan had been all over social media promising mm-hmm. for the qualifying match for the Face of the Revolution ladder match. And we had heard names all over the place from Killer Cross to Bray Wyatt. Yeah. Wendell Rotunda now. Uh, even <laughs> a couple nights ago, Ryback got thrown in Why there. not? But that was also Why for not? shits and giggles, clearly. Um Leo and, Rush, too. Why not? And, and, ah. and Keith Lee. There were so many names that got thrown out in terms of who this person would be that would be making their huge debut. And uh, we ended up getting that. And it ended up being Keith Lee. Mm-hmm. And we'll we'll jump into yeah. that in terms of his match a little bit later. But yeah. we start off Dynamite in Atlantic City. A very dry opening. We get Warlow coming out with some damn cardboard cutouts of MJF. These cardboard cutouts, it was a couple of them. One was of MJF sitting with his uh, legs crossed on top of CM Punk's chest on the Go Home Dynamite leading up to their to their match for the, the following week. Mm-hmm. Not that it was a pay-per-view. but the uh, And then we got another cardboard cutout of MJF putting Punk in a sleeper. Now, Warlow through all of this, he looks annoyed. Yes. Visibly annoyed. He hands Justin Roberts, the ring announcer, some cards with introductions. Introductions for FTR and Tully Blanchard and for Sean Spears, who I did not need to see. And it it occurred to me once and for all that clearly this whole chairman gimmick, I mean, it's clear that Sean Spears really loves La Parca like we all do. Yes. He even came down with the La Parca strut for a little bit with his chair. Yes, Spears, he he comes down, FTR and Telly Blanchard before. They come out with some champagne glasses. They're giving toast. They walk down, followed by Spears, who has a um, a folder, if you will, for Justin Roberts, which has a huge list of accolades of MJF that Justin Roberts is announcing before MJF comes out. This is very over the top. This was to really get you geared up for what was to come, and that's MJF coming out on a throne Mm -hmm. that was carried by various men, and he's got a couple of women that are nearby. He hardcore is making out with one of them before he comes into the ring. He gets in the ring. We get confetti that's falling down. We get Pinnacle minus Wardlow, who's off on his own. They're Mm -hmm. celebrating before MJF ends up grabbing the mic and talks about how he's proven that he is the best on the entire planet after defeating CM Punk twice in his hometown. And uh, he thinks, he says that he couldn't have done it without that big strapping muscular man, Sean Spears, which (laughs) which even furthered, pissed off Wardlow. Now, Spears ends up having a gift for MJF, which is a new Better Than the Best in the World t-shirt, which I'm sure will probably be a hot seller on Pro Wrestling Tees tomorrow. MJF, he is very happy with this, PJ, but now he does what I would expect any guy who comes off a huge win over a Hall of Famer would be eyeing. 
finally, mm. world title aspirations for MJF. Yes. He says that he now wants to be world champion. Now, before he can get into a deep dive on that, we get CM Punk, who walks out of the back, walks on the stage. Tony Schiavone, he meets him on the top of the entrance with a microphone. Punk, he throws some jabs. He mocks MJF's appearance with the spray tan. Um, He quickly realizes that he's at a numbers disadvantage, and that's why he's brought some friends with him. We look into the tunnel, and out comes Sting and Darby Allen with some baseball bats. Punk says that he's getting what he wants, one way or the other, Yeah, which he wants a rematch. Mm-hmm. He says he's either going to get it or they're going to beat it out of MJF. MJF declines on this, but Punk says that he doesn't want the rematch with him. He wants it with the man who really, really beat him. Yeah. That was Wartlow. Yeah. He talks up, gives a fluff piece for Wartlow, says that he needs to leave these losers. He needs to leave them, and he's a, mm-hmm. he's a star in the making. He needs to leave these guys. These guys are holding him down. This fires up Dax, who is ready to fight. MJF, though, he ends up with a better idea. He says since they're in Atlantic City, eh, they should maybe do a little gambling. He has allowed Punk to pick any partner of his choice aside from Sting and Darby, can't be those two, to face the Revival. And if Punk and his partner can defeat the Revival, then he can face MJF in any kind of match that he wants. But for Wartlow, Wartlow, who's already in the suit, he's already spoken for Wartlow, and he's booked a match for Wartlow, which is going to be soon. We'll get on that here in a little yeah. bit. Um, I'm going to be, before we peel off another layer of this that I was hoping would not, let me just go ahead and just throw it out there. As this is going on, as soon as I saw Sting and Darby Allen, you know what I thought? Because we got the revival in the ring. Mm-hmm. Or we've got, I'm sorry, Pinnacle in the ring. Yes. And we've got Punk. But then out comes Sting and Darby Allen. The first thing I'm thinking is, hot damn it, we're going to see Andrade at some point. And Andrade uh. doesn't fit anything no. of what's going on in this segment. No. So that's done. Yes. So then what do we get? Right we away. get a backstage segment of Andrade yes. with Sting and Darby Allen. And he can't let this go about Darby mm-hmm. Allen working for Sting. Sting owning Darby Allen. Sting says that Allen has already explained this many times to Andrade. Allen does not work for him. He's his own man. He's not a boy, by the way. And he uh, doesn't need Sting to yeah. speak for him. And uh, Darby says that he wants the TNT title back. Andrade says that he's going to be the next champ. So neither one of these guys have world title aspirations, rightfully so. But, you know, they're they're really putting some sparkle on the TNT title. But uh, flipping back a little bit, the opening segment between Pinnacle, MJF, and the whole thing. Mm-hmm. We're, we're continuing this thing between the inevitable breakup between MJF and Wardlow. And we got Punk, which uh, clearly we're going to get a rematch of these two based on what ended up happening in that tag team match that we'll mm-hmm. jump on. Opening segment, I know you were you were bouncing around doing multiple things and you were paying attention when you could, but out of what you did see, what did you think opening segment in, in terms of how they're setting this up and how they're playing this forward? I did like this. I did like this segment. I didn't like the Sting and Darby crap afterwards, obviously, but I, I liked how... You know, MJF came out, prickish, you know, get the heat, keep it going. I like how Punk came out, no music, no nothing, came out, came out dry, looked for the microphone, Shivani came over, and then they started going back and forth on it. Liked how Punk was also trying to get Wardlow a little bit, shut some shine on him as well. So trying to build it that way and continue to say, yeah, you don't need to be with these guys, you know, come with me. I'm... I'm kind of surprised. It would have been, I guess, too early, but that Punk would have picked Wardlow as his partner. But as we find out down the road, they went with something else. But I thought that would have been something to the storyline. But, um, yeah, I mean, here we are, and I think this segment did exactly what it needed to do. And, again, I I think we can both agree, and and we had talked about this before, that if anyone was going to defeat – CM Punk and hand him his first loss it regardless had it yeah. had to have been MJF mm-hmm. uh, I mean it was bad enough we weren't seeing enough MJF 
singles matches to begin with. Yes. And he had been losing to guys. He had been losing to Darby. He had been losing to mm-hmm. – um, he did lose to Orange Cassidy, I want to say. Uh, I can't or did remember. They, if I'm that trying was to remember. a tag match but or that how was, they classified that, yeah, it. But, yeah, but we had just too many losses mounting up. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jericho was in the picture there for a bit, and we, we had it all over the place. We really hadn't seen enough single steam on MJF since maybe the Cody feud. Well, as we find out, though, by the end of the show, do any of these damn matches matter anymore? Especially with their very flawed ranking system. We'll get on that, but uh, it's starting to be perplexing how they figure this out. Still on Pinnacle Business, Blade versus Wardlow. Yeah, Wardlow, as we had mentioned before, had already gotten signed up for action. And it was going to be Wardlow versus the Blade. Blade comes out and... uh, there was no Matt Hardy. We figured out why. Well, we fig- yeah, exactly. we figured out why. We'll jump on that in a little bit. But uh, this match, I'll say, this match started off with Warlow kind of getting his ass beat yep. a little bit. Blade stomping him in the corner. Mm-hmm. Finally, Warlow's able to shake him off. Hits him with a belly to belly overhead. They end up heading outside. Warlow, he's throwing them around in the various hard things. They take a break. They come back. And this time we see Warlow. He's hitting a suplex, and then he finally hits Blade with that first power bomb. And then we get the power bomb symphony that's gotten over very well for mm-hmm. Warlow. Finished him off. I thought the match should have been a little quicker. Yes. But they still told the story of Warlow being dead. So uh, post match. Very annoying shit, as always. Yeah. The chairman, Sean Spears, Mm -hmm. whacking Blade. And I'm like, where's the Matt Hardy team to come down? Oh, yeah. And we have heels on heels. Heels on shit up. Yeah. Sean Spears once again stealing the shine off Wardlow. So this pisses Wardlow off. Mm -hmm. We even got terms. You notice that they've been using a lot more insider terms on this show. They should, they, they, as Spears is nailing Blade, we got the. Going into business for himself yes. reference as that's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know your your take on this. I mean, this match was done to it, it was you know done to do what it was supposed to do, and that was to get Wardlow over even more and to get him more hot at the he, pinnacle. He won, but I'm with you. And again, uh, when we get to the other surprise down the road, we have a problem in this company with booking big men and how they should win matches. I'm just. They're taking way too many shots for my pleasure. I, I, I think they should just dominate. Wardlow should have won this damn match in about, you know, two, three minutes. Yeah. That's what it should have been. And I'm with you. They should have made this one a quick one. After that, we get a video package that is for Penta El Cero, but it's Alex <laughs> Operantes that is the voiceover, the voice actor for this. He's doing the promo. With a lot of Penta says, Penta says, Penta says, this all is in reference to Malachi Black and how Penta plans to destroy Malachi and how when he misted him in the eyes, he misted his soul. So we have like five people now fighting over Malachi Black. We yes. have Varsity Blondes, Julia Hart, and now we have Pac, and now we have Penta. It's it's getting very hard to figure out who doesn't have a vendetta against, against Malachi. I mean... Hell, Cody Rhodes should still have one. He's probably got his boots still. Now, before that video package showed off, they were teasing. They were giving you that the inner circle as a whole, they were going to be coming down to have a a meeting with one another. And then we got into that video package. And then as soon as this was over, we were ready to bring out the inner circle. Mm -hmm. Well, only part of the inner circle came out. That was Jericho. And that was Sammy. And that was Jake Hager, who we've barely seen yeah. Recently, they come down. Santana and Ortiz, they come down after, and they come down to their own theme mm-hmm. music, so they've got their own entrance. They come down, and this is – they all get into the ring, and it's down to business. As Santana and Ortiz, they're not in their inner circle gear. Jericho talks about how they wouldn't tag him in during the six-man a few weeks ago, and he wanted to know what was up with that, and I asked you a couple of weeks ago. I said – 
did he and Punk brainstorm this angle because there was a podcast. Jericho and Edge are talking about a house show in which Jericho and Punk, they were partners, and Punk was pissed off during that match, and he never tagged in Jericho throughout the whole match. Mm -hmm. And Jericho said he got pissed at Punk because he told Punk, hey, there were people that actually came here to see me tonight. Yeah. And you, you ripped them. You stole that opportunity from them. Well, he gets on the mic, and what does he tell Santana and Ortiz? What was that all about a couple of weeks ago? There were people who Who came to to see me, me. and you ripped that off from them. So I'm like, did Punk, did he and Punk? Clearly, that's where this. Yes, it's where it came from. That's that's Mm -hmm. been where it came from. But anyways, uh, Jericho, he's talking about that, about how they didn't tag him in. They wanted to know what was up. Santana says that it just boiled down flat out to Jericho only caring about himself. Said that every time Santana and Ortiz are getting closer to winning the tag team titles, they've got to distract themselves away from that because they got to come save Jericho's ass out of whatever that he's got going <laughs> on. So that's not wrong. So Santana and Ortiz, they follow that up by saying the days of bailing out, oh, Chris, those are over because now it's all about Santana and Ortiz getting those tag team titles. Jericho then finally, after he's given permission by Santana to speak, finally after being cut off numerous times, told Santana that he reminds him of an Eddie Guerrero. Although it was a very backhanded Eddie Guerrero compliment as he talked about the unfortunate qualities that Eddie had that reminds Santana of him. Okay, this is the second promo now in a week in wrestling that has been mentioned Guerrero. We had one with The Miz on Monday night, Mm -hmm. same thing, where he was talking to Ray, well, you get glorified for cheating but if I if I do it like you know Eddie did it, you guys glorify it, right? So I mean we're we're kind of on the What's same. What's good thing, for one so. is good for the yes. other, apparently. Yeah. Jericho yeah. says Santana, uh, as he mentioned that whole Eddie Guerrero thing, he says this whole thing uh, with Santana Ortiz lately. This all comes down to one common denominator that is Eddie Kingston getting into the heads and telling Santana and Ortiz stuff and he says to Kingston he's never done anything but it was Jericho who brought them in and is responsible for their success which I'll be honest with you I don't know what success honestly the Santana and Ortiz have really had no. since being with the inner circle in AEW Jericho brings up the fact that they lost their tag team title shots against the Young Bucks about a year ago that's what she says. It had nothing to do with him. He then uh, goes on and say that he brought them both into the inner circle and then he can kick him out. And, and he starts to question what brought in the wrong members of LAX. Mm-hmm. That's when he turns his attention over to Jake Hager and asks them if they if he still has homicide in Hernandez's phone number. This is where Santana, he gets pissed. He goes after Jericho. He has his hands around Jericho's neck at one point. And then Jericho's got his hands on Santana. Sammy Guevara, he tries to jump in between and tries to talk the situation down by saying, hey, we're family. This isn't what we do. Mm -hmm. Jericho snaps on him, tells him, shut up. This gets a reaction from the crowd. Yeah. Guevara then tells Jericho that uh, although he loves every one of those guys in the ring, he'll quit again if the team can't figure this out. So Guevara, he leaves. Ortiz, he's yelling at Jericho about he how he keeps talking about things. And instead of the talking, no more of the talking, they can fight it out next week and settle differences, which Jericho accepts this match. So we got a tag team match now of Santana and Ortiz versus Jericho and Hager, who never talked one time. No. Jericho just signed him up for this damn tag yeah. match, but this is what you're going to get next week. It's going to be Jericho and Hager versus Santana and Ortiz. Uh, your thoughts on this? I'll be honest with you. If this means that the inner circle, not that they, you know, over the last several months have been doing much as a cohesive unit to begin with, if this means that we can finally start to move away and we can tell a different story for Santana and Ortiz and AEW that was maybe never really told before, give them their own chapter. Sammy's already kind of doing his own thing anyways. We could do with or without Jake Hager, and Jericho's going to be Jericho. So if it means, I guess for me, dude, that the inner circle, I won't shed a tear, I guess, if this, you know, if this group has a – 
a demise here over the next several weeks. Well, yeah, they'll have a demise, but then they'll get re back together because in May we got to have a stadium fucking stampede show. So I'm sure they'll have some five on five match coming up. In Are May. you sure that it will be the inner circle that will be in that stampede match? It, they have to be, right? Okay. They have to be. Uh, all right. Because I'm, I'm starting to think that the elite. They're involved in every five on five match. The elite now has 12 members. <laughs> So I mean, take your best five, baby. Kind of <laughs> out of that. So I'm. This is just. Uh, this is unnecessary. Let Santana and Ortiz be on their own. Guevara is actually seems like the one that's actually gotten over out of this whole thing, and it's just trudging along this storyline, not liking it one bit. We get Wheeler Yuta. He's ready for the Young Bucks, but the Bucks they show up early. They're ready to fight right now. They along with Adam Cole they jump. Yuta from behind, big time beat down that's on. Then we get the BTE trigger to Rocky Romero. They turn their attention. They look up to see who it is, and it is none other than New Japan's Jay White who comes in and takes out Romero. And they exchange pleasantries through facial expressions. So it seems mm-hmm. that Jay White, even though there's really no – um bullet club recognition if you will yeah they all seem to be happy with seeing one another so there you go we got an unexpected appearance from jay white who's also been doing some stuff in impact wrestling lately um just a problem with that is they they've got to fix production issues on this they got to remember there's new people tuning in and i know he's a good you know we know wrestling fans we know what it is but the common person would not know who the hell this guy was Put a name on the graphic. Have you noticed that? None of their backstage interviews, on, they don't have any graphics for backstage interviews. They never put names on the fucking backstage to identify with who the hell's talking. I think that's one issue they've got to improve on, especially if you're bringing in new guys like Jay White, who a lot of the population doesn't know. I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that. If you're trying to attract you're new trying fans. You're trying to attract new fans and say, who the hell's that guy? Oh, it's Jay White. His name's right there. You wouldn't know that if you were just not watching the TV. And we've got, of course, another reference to the forbidden door. How many times do we need to yeah. hear the term forbidden door on this show? Yeah, the, the, the I feel like we need to start is... having drinking games going yes. forward <laughs> with AW Dynamite yes. or Rampage with the term forbidden door. Yes. Uh, we get a face of the Ref- Revolution qualifying match. Isaiah Cassidy comes down with mm-hmm. Mark Quinn and Matt Hardy. The mystery opponent. Yes. Keith Lee. Mm hmm. We get Keith Lee. Yes. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were saying he looks like he's gotten in better shape. He looks about the same to me. That's not to say it was good or bad or whatever. He just looks like Keith Lee. He's a big boy. Yep. Um, Fans are singing Bask in His Glory. Lee starts this match off. He launches the shit out of Cassidy. Yes, he does. Um, and, and Cassidy was the perfect guy, actually. Even though they had a few rough spots in this match, mm-hmm. Cassidy was perfect for bumping for Keith Lee. Uh, Cassidy, he ends up getting sent to the outside, but comes back in to fight it out, uh, fight out of a spirit bomb. We get a drop kick that has no effect on Keith Lee, who pounces him out of the ring. Matt Hardy ends up walking out on this match. He walks through the crowd, <laughs> walks off. So now it's just down to Mark Quinn and Isaiah Cassidy. Quinn, as Keith Lee gets on the ring apron, he grabs Lee's leg. This distraction, it allowed Cassidy to basically, this this was a move. It had absolutely no impact. He barely nicked Keith Lee, but he bounces off the turnbuckles and barely taps Keith Lee. Lee drops down off the apron, mm-hmm. actually sold this. Yes. Uh, this allowed for Cassie to try and go for a corkscrew dive to the outside, and that knocked Lee down. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lee was then able to swat a kick to the face out of the way. We get a big bang uh, uh, finish on Lee. I mean, this is a, a match that actually – uh, it was quicker than I, I, I guess. To be fair, Blade is a little bigger, much bigger than yeah than Isaiah Cassidy. But yeah, you know, at least Keith Lee in his debut, he had a match that was less than five minutes. Well, Warlow had to go six and a half with Blade. But anyways, um, th- there you go. I mean, um, 
post match, Mark Quinn, he's going after Keith Lee. He gets knocked down to the floor. Mm-hmm. He then catches a diving Isaiah Cassidy, um, followed by uh, catching Mark Quinn, who dives onto him. Uh, he he takes yeah. him out. It, it was done to do what it was supposed to. The crowd loved it. They just liked seeing just Keith Lee. We haven't really seen him on television the last several mm-hmm. months, even before yeah. the release by WWE. So, uh, But I guess for you, yeah. and maybe you've had some time to think about it. Maybe you haven't, but... Going forward, uh, where, where does Keith Lee fit Well, first on this in, roster? Is he yeah. AEW dark for the time being? I'm being well, serious. Is he? But here's the thing. He is your. He's one of your giant guy. He bumped. He sold way too much in this match. What made Andre the Giant so special? He was a giant. He never got knocked down on his ass. Yeah. This. I mean, the one moment we remember is the supposed slam and we know other guys slammed him yeah. but the hogan slam at mania three lives on keith lee i'm not saying he's the giant like andre was but he's a big ass guy he should not be leaving his damn feet until he faces a big ass guy like archer wardlow uh powerhouse hobbs bigger big big guy he I, I know it's all about wrestling matches in AEW and, and selling and building the guys up. Keith Lee is your giant. Keep him strong. I know he won the match. I would have liked it quicker, but make this make keep this guy a giant. Now, like you said, Dark, I hope to God not. You have to book this guy Well, I mean, you know strong. Keith Lee is going to end up having some AEW Dark matches. Well, is he going to win this tournament? He's. I would have to say he's the favorite right now. Who I'm just saying that Keith Lee, seen? for the time being, unless they already have plans drawn out for him, they just got John Moxley back. We yeah. got to blow off the Brian Danielson thing at some point. MJF's going in a different direction. He got his win over Punk. Punk's doing his thing. Everyone on this roster, for better or for worse, they've got something going on for now. Well, I um, think for Lee right now, just win matches. You just just get him on TV. Have them win matches, and then we'll figure out the story as we go along with who his first feud is. But just get him back on TV, have him win some matches. Hell, have him win this tournament, and then maybe whoever the hell he faces, there's your first feud he has with them. After this, we end up getting another video package this time. This this irritated me just for uh, – well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you here in a sec. But we get <laughs> Mercedes Martinez. Yeah. And Britt Baker. Mm-hmm. And this is all about Thunder Rosa. Britt Baker has been paying off Mercedes Martinez. Martinez has got a little thing going on with Britt Baker right now. This whole thing is designed to end Thunder Rosa, who, without a doubt, and rightfully so, should be the number one contender to Britt Baker's AEW women's title. Yes. We show some footage of Martinez nailing Thunder Rosa in the head with a pipe from last week when they had their match. And now, because apparently we need one in AEW every single week, now we're going to get a match of Mercedes Martinez and Thunder Rosa in a no DQ match. <laughs> uh, again, yeah, it it's losing its value already with with this, and then you're going to see the end of this show. <laughs> every the goddamn ring comes apart. So again, these. Sp- Stipulation matches, they're, they're really starting to lose, especially on free TV all the time. The, you're not saving them for the pay-per-views. I'm, I'm not for this one. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not even there. It's not even to blow off feud. Maybe if you get, you know, Brit and Thunder, but I, I'm, say, I, nah, I'm not here for that. Um, We get our tag match, FTR versus CM Punk and who? Who is Punk going to choose? I didn't mind the choice. I just felt that we should have done a better job of, I guess, promoting certain things. I feel that this guy backstage trying to find somebody and build it up. I feel that this person just should have came out to begin with instead of Sting and Darby Allen, and we could have set up the tag match. Yeah, that too. Partner ends up being John Moxley. Mm -hmm. Wasn't advertised on the show. Didn't get anything about John Moxley going to be on the show, which he's back now. So you would assume going forward, yep. Moxley would be on television every week. But we got no snippets of Moxley being on the show. But anyways, or with Punk, Danielson, who they had the great in-ring promo the week prior, you had none of that story come through this week. 
So we get Moxley. Good choice. Fine. I know we're going to get a good match out of this. Mm -hmm. Those two versus FTR. We get Dax, who's working on Punk's wrist to start. And then Punk, he's out without much effort. Moxley comes in. This is a back and forth between Moxley and Punk to start this match off. Uh, but then everything starts to break down in a hurry. FTR, they get sent to the outside for a dive from Punk, who is now at this point, he's <laughs> yeah. favoring his leg. When we come back from the break, we see Moxley, who's getting choked down in the corner, get some leg drops. That puts Moxley in even more trouble, but he's able to escape and uh, get back in. Um, eventually, though, FTR, they end up hitting the old Midnight Express Vegematic move mm -hmm. on Moxley. They get a two out of that. They get back up. Big clothesline that gets Moxley out of trouble. That allows the hot tag off to Punk. And then we get a Doomsday Device for a close two on Dax. Wheeler then pulls Moxley to the outside for a Tornado DDT before grabbing the ring bell. That's when Punk, he rolled Harwood up for a two. A kick out that lets Wheeler hit Punk with the bell. And then we get a brain buster for a two count on Punk and then a GTS that is uh, countered into the big rig for another two count. Moxley, he ends up coming in to make the save. We get uh, what was going to be a back-to-back -back GTS paradigm shift. That gets broken up. Punk, he pulls Harwood down into uh, Anaconda Vice for the tap which the referee doesn't see. Mm -hmm. uh, that allows Tully Blanchard to hit uh, Punk with a with a jacket. With his coat. Which I, <laughs> it's like, okay. but uh, um, Create the distraction. We, we end up with a GTS that gets put on Tully. Paradigm shift, GTS, that connects. We get a pin. That match went almost about 20 minutes. Wasn't anything offensive. It yeah. was four guys I don't mind watching, and um, there, there you go. I mean, it wasn't like tag team match of the year by any by any means. But look, this is the most action really of yeah. any sort that FTR has gotten in the last couple of months. Yeah, and it wasn't a bad thing for them to have to lose to two former world no. champs. It was it was fine. It was great. I I liked the match, and it felt you know it it went twenty minutes, but it didn't feel like that because they they were fast paced. It was good action. Not flying all over the place, like jumping off the ropes, doing high spots. I mean, they had their dives here and there, but it was good in-ring action, good story. They almost got the win in the end. Moxley breaks up the pin, and then, yes, the good guy, you know, they, they get the victory over FTR, and now the stipulation is in place for MJF. No. Uh, we got a squash match before getting into the main event. We get Jay Cargill, who was facing AEW debut of AQA. Which they put yeah, together we got two debuts back to back. Yeah, we got AQA, who they put together a little package for her, a little stare down promo as she was making herself to the ring. She let you know of who she comes from. She comes from the school of Booker T. Okay. And um, so she's making her debut against Jay Cargill. This is a non title match. And AQA, she goes after the arm early to start. Goes for a short arm scissors, but that immediately gets countered with a dead lift into a slam by Cargill. And uh, she ends up actually hitting a, a drop kick on Car Cargill, who hits heads out to the floor, but then she ends up blasting AQA with a forearm. We take a break. We come back. We see Cargill then hitting an ultimate warrior-style gorilla press slam. AQA, she's able to knock her down again, and then uh, we actually got a shooting star press on Cargill, that got a two count, and then uh, Cargill was able to just end this thing. She mm -hmm. caught AQA with a uh, tour of the islands, finished her off. Seven and a half minutes, I get it, the debut of AQA, and there's actually some things I liked about her. Mm -hmm. um, but my thing is, PJ, you've got many women back there who we never see on TV, many women back there who – we know have been there for the tapings of Dark or for the tapings of Rampage, for the tapings of whatever that, and, you know, maybe this was a favor that was called in. I like AQA. Yeah, you know, hopefully, you know, the, the goal would be when people are usually used as squash, you know, you can get them to go away for a while, yes. bring them back, you yeah. know, maybe a couple of years down the line. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. We continue to see these people. You've already put together some promo package where she's telling you where she comes from or whatever. So yes. it's like, okay, well, yeah. she'll be at AEW for a while as AQA, who's from Booker T's school. Um, Jay Cargill, this match, 
you know, until she faces a big time star in that division, all of her matches should be four minutes and yep. under. Yep. Especially with the streak story they're telling. Every time now we're going to the graphic, which I know Bischoff said something the other week about them doing the Goldberg angler, trying to emulate it, and he was like, you guys aren't even close. But, I I mean, they're already doing the graphic for it. I don't know how long they're going to let it go, but she continues the uh, streak 27 and all. We get a backstage segment of the Young Bucks with Adam Cole. They're ready to go after Wheeler Yuta. Cole says Jay White, he can have their back next time, but the Bucks aren't wild on Cole bringing in Jay White without giving them the heads up. So here we go. The the, the Bucks still, you know, they, they want to know who's coming to play in their yard. And no Bobby Fish, Kyle O'Reilly at all on this show. No, no, we didn't see yeah. those guys <laughs> yeah. at all. So yeah. I guess we got to look and see if they worked at dark or if they're going to be working a match on Rampage. Or if they had a five-match contract. Serena Deeb versus Katie Arquette. I yes. I, See, I was going to say, is this uh, David I relation? I mean, that was the only thing I was thinking. I didn't need to see this match. No. I didn't, I didn't need to see comes down two straight. Just talking on the mic on, during her entrance. And yeah. I, I think that took longer than the match. Yes, we, we are now doing this uh, Serena Deep new professor five-minute rookie challenge. Yeah, this was... No. Five minute time limits. So she's saying there's no one that can hang with her. She doesn't think there's anyone in the locker room that can hang five minutes with her. So that's what we've got. So could go 317. Don't get me See, started. See, I'm just saying what the t shirts the, the t shirts is what shit. pissed me off. Yes. It's like they're mirroring, yeah, mirroring. Exactly. whether it's it, it's yes. intentional or not. They're I don't mirroring. Know if it's a rib or not, but yeah. Fifty eight seconds, Serenity Lot. Got that match over with. Yes. All right, now we've got uh, we're a little strapped for time. We'll try to r- not rush, rush, but we'll try to get into this. We we got our main event, AEW World Title, Hangman Adam Page, the champ versus Lance Archer. This is a Texas death match. <laughs> for their first match, their first meeting. Yes. <laughs> and this feud has not, I mean, it's taken a backseat to a lot of stuff on the card already. And as we're going to find out, on it, the roster. It, it didn't mean shit. Paige, uh, yeah, so he's defending the belt, Texas death match. Fight is on in the back before the bell even rings. They eventually come to the stage, bell ringing. Paige, he hits a running belt shot. Paige then sends, this was the first issue that I had with this match. Archer's the bigger guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paige is sending Archer through the glass wall. Yeah. And now we've got Archer busted open early on in this match. Yeah, they did the wrong guy. The baby face should be always be the first one busted open. So especially we can get this. behind the baby face. Yes, and now you have the baby face beating the shit out of the guy in the first minute and a half backstage. They finally get inside, Paige. He hits the buckshot lariat to send Archer to the outside. We get a seven count. Suicide dive that gets cut off with... Um, Archer, who is now underneath the ring, he comes back yes. from yes, he comes back from underneath the ring, and he whacks Paige in the head with a trash can the lid. Dad, those deadly aluminum lids. Yes, and, and it just we now, haven't learned in 25, 30 years that they really don't do anything. We got the trash can lid that they've been whacked repeatedly on on Paige as this is going on. Dan Lambert now runs down. To unhook the turnbuckle. <laughs> so Paige ends up super kicking yeah. his way out of a choke slam, and it's a moonsault off the barricade to take Archer down. They head back inside. At this point, the top rope is down. Yeah. This so that is takes away the buckshot like lariat. Real shitty visual, too, yeah, on TV. That takes uh, away the buckshot lariat for Paige. We get a break. We come back with now two tables set up at ringside. We get a blackout and a dead eye. Those are both broken up by Paige, who is now bleeding. And he ends up kicking Archer in the face twice. He gets knocked down again. That's when Jake the Snake rocks. He decides to interfere in this. He nails him with a clothesline on the floor. And then he's going to hit him with a DDT. And that's when Archer steps in and says, no, 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 I got this. So we're already starting to play that it's going to be Archer leaning more towards Dan Lambert Mm -hmm. over Jake Roberts. Yep. But it's all good because Jake's still got an extended guaranteed contract here for the next year or two. Um, yeah. We get Paige. He hits one behind Jake's back. 
uh, DDT on Archer. After he low by the way, we get a bunch of kendo stick shots that uh, wakes Archer up. We get a choke slam onto the tra- uh, trash can that knocks Paige silly. But then Archer, um, he would rather whip out a damn fork. This was the other part of the match that really got. Yes. So we get Lance Archer pulling out a, a, a damn fork, and he's appearing to stab Paige in the head with a <laughs> fucking fork. <laughs> Now after this goes yeah. on, we get now we get an Abdullah the Butcher reference, yes. and then as we get a close shot in on Archer's face, he takes the fork with whatever kind of fucking mm-hmm. fake blood substance they have on this fork, and he licks the fork, puts the fork in his mouth, and he licks it. We're not in a pandemic anymore, apparently. <laughs> apparently not. We're licking age. blood. We're. <laughs> Spitting shit all over. I mean, clearly this was some ECW shit that Tony Khan was going for. Archer, he pulls out now. He goes to the outside, pulls out a barbed wire chair before hitting the blackout onto the side of the steps. Do you want to know how comfortable a barbed wire chair is sitting in? For fuck's sakes. Again, another, the the horse shit they find. He hits the blackout, and instead of winning, this is all for the world title, (laughs) Texas Deathmatch. Instead of winning, Archer's got a better idea. He decides to pick him up th- uh, and, and uh, pull Paige's uh, – he has Paige pull the barbed wire off the chair. Yes. Uh, Hangman Page. he then uses the referee instead of the rope with wire around the arm. Yeah. That drives Archer through the tables at ringside. And uh, we ended up basically getting this match to end with a count out. Well, Paid. remember, they went through the table. They went through the table. So those tables that you saw 15 minutes prior, they eventually got used. They the eventually finish. got used, and Paige wins via a count out. So, um, just too much I mean, bullshit goofy, for that. Goofy yeah. shenanigans going on in this match, in the main event. Um, I could have done without the fork spot. <laughs> I guess the bar. They bar- haven't learned from the Domino's Pizza, pizza Cutter spot. Well, I. I I, I could do with without, but uh, there there you go. I mean, the guy who's supposed to retain, he retained, and there you go. But then we have the challenge of somehow a guy that lost to Orange Cassidy a couple weeks ago is your number one Non-sanctioned lights out match, sir. Remember, that doesn't oh, count on the record. Remember that. Yeah, yeah we got Adam Cole who it. comes from the back. He picks up the belt, and now we have our next challenger for Hangman Adam Page's belt. We got two Adams. That's right. We got a Cole, we got a Page, and none of them are really going to matter because the other names well, is what on everyone the way wants. That Page was kicking Archer's ass in this match. He should have no problem with Adam Cole, you would think, right? Well, yeah, the way Cole's been used so far in AEW, yeah, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, overall, I guess if I were to rank this AEW Dynamite episode, I, I would give it a B minus. Yeah, I'm there with you. Yeah, cool. I mean it was. Yeah, it's ups and downs like most of them do. And there you go. Yeah, it was pretty solid. Your AEW Dynamite review for February 9th, 2022 for their Atlantic City show. Let us know what you thought in the comments. Let us know what you thought of the show. Would you grade it higher? Would you grade it lower? We'd love to know. Be sure to like and subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and follow us. Promise we'll follow back on social media at Bush League MS Pod. Later, guys.